The End of Utopia by Russell Jacoby. Chapter 2. The Myth of Multiculturalism. Why put recipes for cheese balls on revolutionary flags? Asked Obi Hardison Jr., the classicist, in his book on American cultural identity. He was referring to the national motto, E Pluribus Unum, one out of many, or out of many, one which appears on coins and official symbols of the United States. According to Hardison, the motto, the motto derives from a poem of Virgil that gave a recipe for a cheese ball, a favorite of Roman farmers. You put all the ingredients of the cheese ball into a bowl, says Virgil, mix them together, and presto, for many, you get one. Oh, shit, really? Huh. Oddly little, oddly little consensus exists as to where the American motto came from or what it means. If Virgil was the ultimate source, the exact phrase does not appear in the Roman poet. In fact, the motto shows up in the works of no Latin writer. The originators of the Great Seal of the United States, who sanctioned the, the, the saying, included Jefferson, Adams, and Franklin. They commissioned a Swiss-French artist to design the seal, and either he or Franklin borrowed the words from a well-known English journal, The Gentleman's Magazine, where E. Pluribus Unum regularly ran on the title page. The Gentleman's Magazine, in turn, had picked it up from an earlier period periodical published in London by French Huguenot Pierre-Antoine Monteau who seemed to have invented the motto. In affixing E. Pluribus Unum to his journal, Monteau meant almost the opposite of what the motto was often said to signify, that which is prefixed to this miscellany. Monteau wrote in 1692, referring to E. Pluribus Unum, implies that though only one of the many pieces in it were acceptable, it might gratify every reader. For Monteau, many do not make one. Rather, he believed his magazine succeeded if only one con contribution out of the many pleased the reader. In adopting the epigram for the Gentleman's Magazine, its editor, Edward Cave, seemed to have something else in mind. Cave's magazine often consisted of material abridged from other sources. E. Pluribus Unum implied the editor made one issue out of many many separate pieces, a common practice of the day. Early English magazines often sported mottos that alluded to their diversity. Cave also copied the motto, more in quantity and greater variety than any book of the kind in price. His use of E Pluribus Unum may have had less to do with cheese balls than advertising. Cave, who also had the habit of pinching, altering, and fabricating material for his magazine, earned a reputation as a literary buccaneer. Moreover, Monteau, who invented the slogan, led a less than sterling life, and died strangled in a brothel. In short, E. Pluribus Unum, the elevating motto of American cultural pluralism, not only lacks a clear classical legacy, it is shot through with ambiguity and scandal. One 19th century historian who reflected on this tangled history found the story shameful. We have been singularly unfortunate in our choice of a motto, and it would be difficult to find one more infelicitous or more inappropriate for a great nation than E. Pluribus Unum. Surely nothing could be more unbecoming or more insignificant. A motto of modern plebeian and non-classic origin, with no literary or historic associations, a motto utterly void of all religious or moral tone, a motto that may mean either union or disunion, according to one's sympathies, and which unhappily meant the latter in the mind of its originator. Every citizen who has the best interests of his country at his heart must regret that our present motto was so unfortunately chosen and is so utterly unfit for a great republic. However, this unedifying motto and the pluralism it implies or bellies have bewitched the American Republic from its beginning, 
and never more than in recent years when an interest has become an obsession. Few causes have won such widespread enthusiasm as pluralism and its incarnations, as multiculturalism, cultural diversity, and cultural pluralism. The phrases kick off a thousand speeches and articles. They appear in hundreds of essays and books. Government officials, college administrators, corporate executives, museum curators, and high school principals, to name just a few, declare their commitment to multiculturalism. One sign of the times, the American Council on Education published a guide to programs and publications on cultural diversity that runs 400 pages. Even conservatives who might be expected to swim against the current often jump in, confining their objections to fringe deformations, not the thing itself. Publicly, at least, they hesitate to forcefully protest a larger multiculturalism. To establish its credentials, a conservative foundation put out a magazine called Diversity, edited by an African-American with the name David S. Bernstein. Liberals and leftists run the show. They define themselves by their enthusiasm for multiculturalism. The more you support it, the more virtuous you are. Lawrence Levine's The Opening of the American Mind, the liberal rejoinder to Bloom's The Closing of the American Mind, brims with enthusiasm for multiculturalism. We have rediscovered that sense of excitement, that sense of as yet unrealized possibilities. Scholars have finally set about exploring and amending and expanding the notions of pluralism. For liberals or leftists to challenge multiculturalism is like questioning recycling. Multiculturalism was not always so popular. Horace M. Kalin, who virtually copyrighted the term cultural pluralism, stated in 1924 that the idea was popular nowhere in the United States. He knew why. Vast immigration and World War I aggravated the public's fears of foreigners. Americanization and assimilation, not pluralism and diversity, became the watchwords. For Kalin, the revived Ku Klux Klan exemplified a repressive American conformity. The alternative before Americans is Coulter Klux Klan, or cultural pluralism. Seventy years later, everyone, except for a few conservative dissenters, has joined Kalin in celebrating cultural pluralism. We are all multiculturalists now, concluded Nathan Glazer. We can still argue about the details, but multiculturalism is here to stay. Its victory is complete. Once cultural pl- pluralism has been um, had been a minor movement in the history of the American academic and literary intelligentsia, writes the historian David A. Hollinger. By the 1990s, however, a sea change, a sea change had taken place. Since the earlier discussion, the most striking difference is the sheer triumph of the doctrine that the United States ought to sustain rather than diminish a great variety of distinctive cultures. Now, opponents of this idea are very much on the defensive in national politics, the mass media, public education, and academia. Even backers of a radical multiculturalism who revile a liberal variant proclaim they ride the crest of history. Christopher Newfield and Avery F. Gordon, two University of California professors, rebuke Rush Limbaugh, the conservative commentator, for his attacks on multiculturalism, observing he rightly feels marginal to a diversity that is becoming an accomplished fact in the realm of culture. The language is revealing. Diversity commands the mainstream. The conservative naysayer is on the margins. How come? Has a program supported by Kalin and a few other dissenting intellectuals simply won everyone over? Has a new and varied immigration forced recognition of cultural diversity? Have cultural groups become more assertive and Americans more tolerant, liberal, and cosmopolitan? Is the applause for multiculturalism a straightforward success story, one of increasing enthusiasm for increasingly diverse America? Or is it the result, as Nathan Glazer believes, of the failure to bring a larger share of blacks into the common society? Each of these explanations expresses a partial truth, but a vital part of the story has been omitted. Multiculturalism also plugs a gaping intellectual hole. Stripped of a radical idiom, robbed of a utopian hope, liberals and leftists retreat in the name of progress to celebrate diversity.
with few ideas on how a future should be shaped, they embrace all ideas. Pluralism becomes the catch-all, the alpha and omega of political thinking. Dressed up as multiculturalism, it has become the opium of disillusioned intellectuals, the ideology of an era without an ideology. The issue is not cultural pluralism itself. Ideas of diversity and its kin, pluralism, variety, cultural pluralism, and multiculturalism are neither false nor objectionable. On the contrary, they are true and attractive. Diversity characterizes the natural, physical, and cultural wor worlds, and we generally take delight in differences, not uniformity. Most people, and probably most philosophers, prefer pluralism and diversity to totality and the absolute. William James, for instance, complained of the glut of oneness with its dogmatic rigidity, which is threatened by the slightest suspicion of pluralism, the minutest wiggle of independence. The problem is not a preference for pluralism, but its cult. The fetish sabotages sober inspection of reality by catering to the American love of quantity. The lingo of pluralism underwrites the basic hype that more is better. More things, items, cars, and cultures. Multiculturalism is obviously better than monoculturalism. A world of differences trumps a world of uniformity. But what exactly is multiculturalism? The ideas of multiculturalism, cultural plagiarism, and diversity turn sacrosanct. They become blank checks payable to anyone in any amount, lacking meaning or content. They not only suggest a politics, but often replace politics. However, even with adjectives like radical or transformative attached, what politics do they designate? Apart from the wish to include more voices in the curriculum or different faces at the office, no vision drives multiculturalism. A term bandied about in discussions of multiculturalism, inclusiveness, suggests conformity. The document drawn up by activists for a New York state education reform was titled A Curriculum of Inclusion. The goal of including more people in the established society may be laudable, but hardly seems radical. The rise of multiculturalism correlates with the decline of utopia, an index of the exhaustion of political thinking. Several questions are rarely asked, much less answered, in the discussions of multiculturalism. How pluralistic is cultural pluralism? What are the real differences between cultures? What do the words culture and pluralism signify? Why did they become the preferred terms? How and why have cultural analyses replaced economic and sociological approaches? What is the relationship of politics to cultural plural plural pluralism? To get at the terms culture and pluralism would require volumes, especially the word culture. Here only a few strands of this story. Here only a few strands of this story and a few of its consequences can be discussed. When I hear the word culture, I reach for my gun. This famous line comes from a 1933 German play, Schlageter, by Hans Jost. A more accurate rendering of the German runs, when I hear the word culture, I release the safety on my Browning. The name Browning in Europe, more than the United States, became identified with automatic and semi-automatic guns designed by the American John M. Browning. Gavrilo Princip, who commenced World War I, by assassinating Archduke Franz Ferdinand, used a Browning 32 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Jost, a playwright and poet, shifted from the expressionism of World War I to the Nazism of World War II. With loving dedication and unswerving loyalty, Jost inscribed Schlegger to Adolf Hitler. The work expressed typical nationalist and anti-intellectual contempt for liberalism, encapsulated in the idea of culture. In the play, a World War I veteran chides his pal for lapsing into liberalism. And the last thing I'll stand for is ideas to get the better of me. I know that rubbish from 18. Fraternity, equality, freedom, beauty, and dignity. No, let him keep their good distance with their whole ideological kettle of fish. I shoot with live ammunition.
When I hear the word culture, I release the safety on my browning. Culture here implies liberalism and the Enlightenment, everything the Nazis despised. Yet it was not only the far right that loathed culture, but the far left as well. With an unsettling kinship to Jost's formulation, the Martinique psychiatrist Franz Fanon wrote in The Wretched of the Earth, when the native hears a speech about Western culture, he pulls out his knife, or at least makes sure it is within reach. This view of culture roughly parallels that of Jost. Talk of fraternity, equality, beauty, and dignity drives the native to violence. The disdain for culture expressed by Jost and Fanon is not identical, however. Both despise the deceit of culture, but for opposite reasons. For Jost, culture is in itself a fraud, the cheap talk of weaklings. For Fanon, culture deceives by reneging on its promises. Jost and the Nazis hated culture itself. Fanon hated its hypocrisy, a very different notion. Liberals also denounced culture. John Bright, a 19th century orator and liberal member of parliament, complained that when people talk about what they call culture, they mean a smattering of two dead languages of Greek and Latin. Frederick Harrison, a follower of Comte and positivism, concurred. Perhaps the silliest cant of the day is the cant about culture. Culture applied to politics means simply a turn for small fault-finding, love of selfish ease and indecision in action. All quarters targeted what might be called a classical notion of culture that emerged with the Enlightenment. Ideas about education, cultivation, and progress drenched culture, which implied a notion of progress. The words Enlightenment, culture, and education, wrote Moses Mendelssohn in 1784, are newcomers to our language. Linguistic usage, which seems to want to create a distinction between these synonymous words, still has not had the time to establish their boundaries. All cultural progress, wrote Kant 15 years later, represents the education of man. The most important object of culture is man endowed with reason. Kant called this process the gift of becoming civilized through culture. To fict, culture was the exercise of all powers towards the end of full freedom. This concept of culture, attacked from the right and left, limped into the 20th century, but did not survive. For conservatives, it was too liberal. For leftists, too elitist. Liberal anthropology struck the decisive blows. In 1952, two anthropologists, A. L. Krober and Clyde Cluckon, published a historical survey charting the fluctuating fate of the term culture. The most generic sense of the word culture in Latin and in all the languages which have borrowed from the Latin root retains the primary notion of cultivation or becoming cultured. A second concept to emerge was that of German Kultur, roughly the distinctive higher values or enlightenment of a society. According to Krober and Kluckon, the older and restricted meaning of culture had slowly ceded to a more expansive and scientific definition. They dated the more scientific version from E.B. Taylor's 19th century primitive culture, which offered a, de a dispassionate definition of culture as a complex whole, which includes knowledge belief, art, law, morals, customs, and other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. Older usages assuming a hierarchical order still lingered, however. Even intellectual and semi-intellectual circles reverted to obsolete definitions. Krober and Klockon wanted to hasten the victory of an objective and plastic notion of culture. That was the point of their book. There would be no need for this monograph, they said, if people generally used the scientific term. The key work undermining the classical definition may have been Ruth Benedict's 1934 Patterns of Culture, a 20th century anthropological bestseller. Benedict surveyed three peoples, the American Indians of the Southwest Pueblos, those of the Northwest Coast, and the Dobu of Melanesia. 
arguing not only against biological determinism, but for the real relativity of cultures. Social thinking at the present time, she concluded, has no more important task before it than that of taking adequate account of cultural relativity. 25 years later, Margaret Mead noted that when Benedict Benedict began Patterns of Culture, her definition of culture belonged only to the vocabulary of a small and technical group of professional anthropologists. Now it had become common usage. Since these remarks, the anthropological concept of culture has completely swallowed the older notion. Culture has severed links to cultivation and reason and become any ensemble of activities. As one historian has put it, today's multiculturalists are the intellectual descendants of Benedict. The newer definition did not win without protest. From Matthew Arnold in Culture and Anarchy to T.S. Eliot in Notes Towards the Definition of Culture, some scholars and critics sought to preserve culture as the realm of education, art, and improvement. For instance, in the 1920s, the classicist Werner Jagger wrote that the new terminology led to a leveling in which antiquity became simply one culture out of many. The anthropological concept has made culture a mere descriptive category, which can be applied to any nation, even to the culture of the primitive. The counter-movement, largely by conservatives, was futile. Liberals, leftists, sociologists, psychologists, and anthropologists, among others, rejected as reactionary any hierarchical view of culture or any distinction between an elite culture and common civilization. <clears throat> Neither Marxists nor psychoanalysts saw any justification in separating culture from civilization. I scorn to distinguish between culture and civilization, wrote Freud. The gain was obvious. In the name of liberalism and science, anthropologists effectively dispatched as prejudiced the narrow idea of culture, which often was implicitly or explicitly racist. Earlier definitions tied to ideas about education and cultivation necessarily included judgments. Some societies or groups might be less cultivated or practiced in the arts of freedom. The new concept implied no evaluation. Cultures could not be ranked or rated. They were all equal. Culture became a fact of human life. For many anthropologists, the new concept of culture delivered a death blow to pseudoscientific racism. From the beginning of his career almost to his death in 1942, Franz, Franz Boas, the main figure in American anthropology, forcefully argued that human differences were, were cultural, not biological. In 1906, W.E.B. Du Dubois invited Boas to address a black audience at Atlanta University, where the anthropologists championed the abilities of the American Negro. To those, stoutly ma to those who stoutly maintain a material infori inferiority of the black race and who would damper your ardor by their claims, you may confidently reply that the past history of your race does not sustain their statement but rather gives you encouragement. No scientific evidence supports the idea of Negro inferiority. Boas's influence in matters of race can hardly be exaggerated, writes the historian Carl N. Degler. He accomplished his mission largely through his ceaseless, almost relentless articulation of the concept of culture. The anthropological notion of culture exuded a liberal and egalitarian ethos. This is its appeal and its truth. Yet culture also lost any specificity, becoming everything and anything. When culture is defined as an ensemble of tools, codes, rituals, behaviors. Not simply every people, but every group and subgroup has a culture. The shift towards symbolic perspective by anthropologists further flattened and extended the turf. No longer is culture restricted to the ensemble of activities of a people, but any activity of any group might form a culture or subculture. Everything is culture. An essay by the anthropologist Clifford Geertz analyzes common sense as a cultural system.
Krober and Kluckon had admitted that anything might constitute a culture. What determines a particular culture is simply convenience and the level of abstraction. The conceptual loss seems small. What is the danger if every group can be viewed as a culture, if every activity can be viewed culturally? A short step, however, leads from considering common sense a cultural system to treating the culture of drug addicts, soccer moms, or fans of Star Trek. Of course, everyone has his or her own list, but the upshot is that each configuration forms a culture. Yet this can be questioned. Different traits might not constitute a distinct culture. The elastic notion of culture served well to undermine prejudice and ethnocentrism. Any damage was not obvious and initially was unimportant. Yet social usefulness does not equal truth. A conceptual bill went unpaid, and over the years, costs have mounted. A return to a hierarchical notion of culture is not desirable, but an advance to some precision may be. Without considering what separates one culture from another, talk of multiculturalism succumbs to myths and illusions. If we cannot establish what defines a unique culture, how can we understand the relationship between two or more cultures, or multiculturalism. To put this sharply, multiculturalism relies on an intellectual route, the refusal or inability to address what makes up a culture. In the conceptual defeat, culture is subjectivized. Culture becomes whatever any group or researcher wants it to mean. No one challenges that a collection of people constitutes a separate culture. At the same time, the jargon of cultural diversity obscures social and economic realities, which turn either irrelevant or uninter uninteresting. Multiculturalists see only culture and hardly attend to economic imperatives. Yet how can culture subsist apart from work and the production of wealth? And if it cannot, how can culture be apprehended without considering its entanglement in economic realities? If the economic skeleton of culture were put on the table, patter about diversity might cease. It would be clear that the diverse cultures rest on the same infrastructures. What does it mean if two different cultures partake of identical economic activities? What does it imply if the same jobs, housing, schools, modes of relaxing and loving inform two cultures? To put this differently, what does cultural pluralism signify in the absence of economic pluralism? Perhaps the question seems meaningless, yet the apparent lack of meaning signals the intellectual retreat. The economic structure of society, call it advanced industrial society or capitalism or the market economy, stands as the invariant. Few can imagine a different economic project. The silent agreement says much about multiculturalism. No divergent political or economic vision animates cultural diversity. From the most militant Afrocentrists to the most ardent feminists, all quarters subscribe to very similar beliefs about work, equality, and success. The secret of cultural diversity is its political and economic uniformity. The future looks like the present with more options. Multiculturalism spells the demise of utopia. No one contests the importance of jobs and wages in everyday life but even the remaining Marxists lose interest. For decades, critics have deplored the narrow materialism of Marxism. Much of this criticism has been to the point. The critics succeeded beyond their wildest dreams, however. Economic Marcus Marxism became cultural Marxism. The valid criticism of a reductionist Marxism passed into a complete surrendering of its materialist core. Today, Marxism trades in spirits, texts, images, and echoes, and flourishes only in departments of literature and English. Derrida's book on Marx, aptly titled Spectres of Marx, deals with ghosts and reflections. 19th century Marxism was materialistic and determinist. Late 20th century Marxism is idealist and incoherent. Outside of Marxism, the same tendencies prevail. Culture is sexy, economics pedestrian. Strife about wages and work seems boring. 
conflicts involving gays, lesbians, or women, notes Stanley Aaronowitz, provoke attention and discussion. In contrast, a national 1993 mine workers strike competes with the obituary columns for space on the back pages of the Daily Press. David Bromwich has wondered whether intellectuals today would pose an economic slavery, would oppose an economic slavery if it lacked any racial or cultural dimension. The question is hardly moot as economic inequalities augment and harden. To the degree that culture subsumes everything, politics loses meaning. Of course, adherents of cultural pluralism often write of its politics. They, reiter they reiterate endlessly the proposition that all of society and its constructs are political. Texts, contexts, readings, authors, books, curriculums. Yet when everything is political, nothing is, or nothing is more political than anything else. Recoding a text is as politically charged as refashioning state power. Evidently, multiculturalism is political, but how exactly? In the main, as advanced by radicals and academics, politics becomes simply a series of slogans about marginalization, power, discourse, and representation. These terms address real problems, but they fail to specify any particular politics. Marginal groups want power or representation, but how or why does this reflect cultural, rep uh, cultural differences or an alternative vision? In the long run, intellectual history cannot be divorced from political and social history. The onset of Nazism in the 1930s and the Cold War in the 1950s affected the fate of the idea of pluralism. These events brought a notion of pluralism to the surface as an antidote to a new term, perhaps a new reality, totalitarianism. The word totalitarianism referring to Italian fascism first appeared in the 1920s. After 1933, some critics extended it to Nazism. With its program of Gleichschaltung, total coordination of society, and the total state, Nazism could properly be dubbed totalitarian. Yet the label really entered popular and scholarly discourse once Soviet communism fell under its rubric. Initially, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany seemed fundamentally different, and few sought to include them under one conceptual framework. Indeed, for much of the 1930s, the two countries were sworn enemies. Of course, this changed dramatically in August 1939 when the signing of the Non-Aggression Pact between Germany and the Soviet Union, or with the signing of the Non-Aggression Pact between Germany and the Soviet Union. After this date, many liberal thinkers looked at Nazism and Soviet communism as related systems, adopting the term totalitarianism as the preferred label for both. At a scholarly symposium held in Philadelphia soon after the pact, a speaker noted that the, that the basic encyclopedia and the social sciences jumped from torts to totem, totemism, with no reference to totalitarianism. Abbot Gleason, a professor of Russian history, <coughs> uh, sorry, Abbot Gleason, a professor of Russian history, writes that within a few months, the word entered common discourse. In the years 1940 and 1941, the terms totalitarian and totalitarianism became coin of the realm in newspapers and periodicals. Around this time, observers rediscovered pluralism and diversity as the essence of liberalism, which they contrasted to both monolithic Nazi and communist regimes. At the 1939 symposium, a speaker listed anti-pluralism as a principle of the totalitarian and the monistic states. Pluralism, a doctrine defended by liberalism, negates the very character of the totalitarian state. Over the next, over the next several decades, this perspective on totalitarianism, with its ode to Western pluralism, enjoyed great success. Its impact was probably... Uh, aided by the fact that its leading exponents were refugees from European Nazism and communism, scholars of considerable intellect and prestige such as Hannah Arendt, Karl Popper,
F. A. Hayek, Jacob Talman, and Isaiah Berlin. For several reasons, most writings on totalitarianism targeted Marxism and communism, not Nazism. Marxism possessed it possessed an intellectual credibility and heft, absent in Nazism, a mishmash of nationalist and anti-Semitic notions. For scholars analyzing the sources of totalitarianism, Marxism offered something to bite into. The intellectual substance of Nazism was nil. Moreover, communism preceded and outlasted Nazism. After 1945 and the onset of the Cold War, totalitarianism signified the Soviet Union. Nazism had disappeared. The term totalitarian, writes the historian Andrzej um, Walicki, came to be applied to every country in which a party, party calling itself communist remained in power. For Western liberals, the main threat to freedom came from Marxism and communism. The 1952 study of totalitarianism by the Polish-Israeli historian Jacob Talman, who identified himself as someone who has lived through the traumatic experiences of Nazism and communism, says virtually nothing about the former. From the vantage point of the mid-20th century, Talman wrote in the first paragraph of The Origins of Totalitarian Democracy, The history of the last 150 years looks like a systematic preparation for the headlong collision between empirical and liberal democracy on the one hand, and totalitarian democracy on the other. Totalitarian democracy meant communism, not Nazism. This reading of history surprised even some of Talman's students and followers. Nazism and genocide disappeared. Yehoshua Ariely, chairman of the Talman Memorial Foundation, cited these same opening sentences and commented, the phenomenon of the Holocaust as key to the understanding of the modern human condition is in a curious way overlooked. It does not fit into the interpretative account that Talman gives of the last 150 years. Writings on totalitarianism posited a rough equivalence of Nazism and communism. They were both total systems straightjacketing life and thought. However, Insofar as Marxism, not fascism, was the object of study, a shift in emphasis and perhaps logic took place. Pluralism was celebrated against the left, and the denunciation of the total system imperceptibly became the denunciation of utopia, as if they were obviously linked. Are they? In fact, totalitarianism and utopianism are not necessarily related at least without distending the concept of utopianism into obscurity. It would be difficult to find a utopianism within Nazism. Yet the liberal consensus successfully established a rough equivalence of utopianism and totalitarianism, setting both against liberal pluralism. Damning totalitarianism meant damning utopianism. These ideas found their most popular exposition in a bestseller published at the end of World War II, the Road to Serfdom, by F. A. Hayek, an Austrian economist and philosopher who had settled in England. For Hayek, communism and fascism were merely variants of the same totalitarianism, which he argued in a chapter titled The Great Utopia. Yet his real concern was the increasing socialist sentiment of his new home and the dangers of a welfare state. He called his book a warning to the socialist intelligentsia, Democratic socialism relied on general and utopian ideas, he believed, that brought an end to individual liberty. Karl Popper's writings also did much to spread the belief that utopianism equaled totalitarianism and both undermined pluralism. As with Talman and Hayek, the argument unfolded mainly against the left. His 1945 The Open Society and Its Enemies opened with Plato and lavished chapters on Hegel and Marx, but in two volumes hardly mentioned Nazism. It closed with a ringing defense of our Western civilization as essentially pluralistic. In addition to Hannah Arendt, whose origins of totalitarianism attacked the Soviet and Nazi systems for relying on total ideologies, Isaiah Berlin must be credited for establishing pluralism as a liberal creed. He decreed the total and ideological approach the single, all-embracing, all-clarifying, all-satisfying plan. 
He feared the totally planned society that might eventually cast aside the infinite variety of persons. Few ideas in political thought have enjoyed as much success as Berlin's propositions about two concepts of liberty. They have elicited a shelf load of commentary. Berlin proposed that historically two varieties of freedom existed, negative and positive. The former constitutes the domain of non-interference, where the individual is free from external control. The latter relies on an image of freedom and inexorably leads in the direction of control, regulating how people will live. Since not all individuals will support the same plan or vision, positive freedom requires coercion. For Berlin, positive freedom constituted the heart of many of the nationalist, communist, authoritarian, and totalitarian creeds of our day. He concluded two concepts of liberty by praising pluralism and denouncing total plans. Berlin, Popper, Arendt, and the other and the others carried the day. In the 1940s and 1950s, the prevailing wisdom held that diversity and pluralism were the defining features of American society in particular, and the wider tradition of Anglo-American liberalism in general. Totalitarian societies, on the hand, or on the, on the hand, on the one hand, resting on ideology and utopia, were inherently dictatorial. Um, pluralism is a characteristic feature of democracy, which is, oppo- which is opposed to the uniform and monolithic and totalitarian societies, stated one summary of the scholarly consensus. As World War II receded into the past, analyses of totalitarianism increasingly concentrated on Marxism and the Soviet Union. The Cold War infused the idea of pluralism. Berlin is again illustrative. Though his critique of totalitarianism remained abstract, his concrete examples frequently came from Marxism. Indeed, his entire argument about positive liberty necessitating total control hardly makes sense for Nazi, racist, or nationalist ideologies. These doctrines did not presuppose a positive liberty they sought to enforce. They assumed no idea of liberty. Berlin's work addresses communism and Marxism, not Nazism and fascism. It was tilted against the left, not the right. In other words, Berlin's ideas partook of the Cold War. He was rather proud, according to one account, to be a Cold War liberal. His credentials could hardly be contested. During the war in Vietnam, Berlin did not want to criticize the Americans. It is frightful that Vietnamese villages should be bombed and the innocent continuously killed, he wrote. But it seems to me even more dreadful to abandon people. How is one to guarantee that a, that a precipitate, and precipitate and total American withdrawal would not cause other Southeast Asian governments to be intimidated into knuckling under to regimes which many of their citizens would surely hate? The Cold War shaped and colored American pluralism. In the typical interpretation against totalitarianism, a series of contending and diverse groups constituted the genius of American society. It's remarkable pluralism. This often repeated proposition explains why 1960s critics and scholars turned against pluralism with a vengeance. Pluralism became identified with the establishment. With the onset of the civil rights movement in the Vietnam War, younger critics Critics objected to a picture of a benign America defending the world from totalitarianism. What was so pluralistic about segregation or bombing Hanoi without voting a declaration of war? The notion of pluralism and its opposite totalitarianism seemed less a theory than a conformist defense of American society, exactly when racial and anti-war protests challenged American righteousness. It is obvious that in using the the totalitarian model, wrote Alfred G. Meyer, a Soviet specialist, American scholars were also celebrating Americanism and at the same time succumbing to Cold War hysteria. In A History of the Word Totalitarianism, Abbott Gleason provides a generational account of disenchantment with the ideology of pluralism. My initial rejection of these views of totalitarianism and pluralism began in college, he writes, took on a more coherent form in the civil rights movement, and continued in opposition to the Vietnam War. 
Protesting students came to believe that major financial and political power in the West, capitalism itself, eviscerated pluralism. Many younger scholars... <sighs> Sorry. Many younger scholars found the Manichaean uh, division into good and evil, white hats and black hats, Democrats and totalitarians, implausible, and after a while, insufferable. The term free world, so often used as an antonym to, total to totalitarian, seemed increasingly hollow. Critiques of pluralism formed the backbone of many leftist political writings from the 1960s. A collection of dissenting pieces on power and community targeted the myth that American society is pluralistic. The main substantive theme that unites all these essays is our rejection of that myth. Our conviction that the concept of democratic pluralism has been ideological and obscurantist, and that our political order is neither genuinely pluralistic nor always democratic. Henry S. Carrillo's 1961 book, The Decline of American Pluralism, argued that the state and corporations undercut pluralism. Michael Rogan, a Berkeley political scientist, opened his 1967 study of McCarthyism with an attack on the idea of pluralism. He noted that American intellectuals gravitated toward pluralism under the impact of the 1950s conformity and anti-communism. The idea of pluralism meant political retreat. The historian John Higgum, in a comprehensive survey, noted that those radicals who pay heed to the theory of pluralism denounce it. These references can be easily multiplied. For several decades, the idea of pluralism exuded political conformity and Cold War anti-communism. A new generation of scholars and critics come, coming of age in the 1960s denounced it. No longer, the interpretation of totalitarianism that damned utopianism alongside Nazism and communism proved dominant. The battle cry of pluralism easily overran all stations. No prisoners were taken, but no soldiers were found. Critics of pluralism spawned by the 1960s vanished almost without a trace. Why? No single reason explains the renewed popularity of pluralism. The rapid demise of socialism knocked the intellectual breath out of leftists. Um, what the fuck? Lacking confidence or belief in a complete social restructuring, they retreated to partial beliefs in partial cultures. Um, pluralism. Liberals needed little encouragement. They were always attracted to pluralistic ideas and freed from sharp criticism from a left that redoubled their commitment. Pluralism, the ideology of the market and the individual, becomes the bedrock principle for liberals and leftists. Pluralism returns as radicalism ebbs. Nor is this wholly objectionable. Not every age spawns bold ideas about society. In its various forms, perhaps pluralism is the best our era has to offer. Yet the retreat is presented as an astounding advance. A familiar, if not banal idea, pluralism is dubbed cutting edge. Printed with culture or christened multiculturalism, it becomes a mythology of our time. The literature on multiculturalism includes much that is reasonable and necessary. It is surely fair that various histories, long slated, should get a hearing in curriculums. It is desirable that people of all kinds populate the stories children read and the books they study. We want students to know that there were black scientists, Jewish gangsters, and women artists. We want curriculums to reflect the complexity of history in society. These projects remain urgent and legitimate, yet they constitute only a fraction of a multicultural argument that goes far beyond revising curriculums to address vast tracts of life and letters. Outside of the curriculum debates and sometimes within them, multiculturalism easily loses its bearings. Driven by abstract culture and a formalist pluralism, Multiculturalism gives rise to programs and notions that lag far behind social and economic developments. Hundreds of essays on cultural identity fling out references to Derrida and Foucault with little purchase on their topic. 
endless discussions of multiculturalism proceed from the unsubstantiated assumption that numerous distinct cultures constitute American society. Only a few historians or observers even consider the possibility that the opposite may be true, that the world and the United States are relentlessly becoming more culturally uniform, not diverse. Serious reflections about the cultural pluralism must at least consider the relentless forces of cultural homogenization and ask the questions, how can pluralism exist within uniformity? What is the possibility of multiple cultures within a single consumer society? To ask is partially to answer, for it is possible that cultural diversity and social homogeneity are connected inversely. The call for cultural identity may arise as a response to its demise. No group is able, and, if, and few are willing, to stand up to the potent homogenizing forces of advanced industrial society. All Americans, from African Americans to Greek Americans, buy the same goods. Um, sorry. Look at the same movies and television, pursue the same activities, and have more or less the same desires for success. From the angle of marketing, these groups may show up as distinct consumers of music or sports, but this hardly constitutes fundamental identities. All differences between groups have not disappeared. This is obvious. Yet they may progressively decline. Exactly for this reason, they assume increasingly increasing importance for individuals. It is the rootless, not the rooted, who fetishize their roots. The revival of ethnic identity amid its real decline may be news to the dogmatic exponents of multiculturalism, but not to historians of immigration and assimilation. One highly regarded historian of immigration, Marcus Lee Hansen, formulated a generational law that speaks to this very issue. He called the law the principle of third-generation interest, which can be summed up in the maxim, what the son wishes to forget, the grandson wishes to remember. According to Hansen, first-generation immigrants burdened with material cares paid little heed to the old world culture from which they came. Their sons and daughters taunted by native-born Americans, wanted to escape from the foreign language, religion, and family customs, and they adopted a policy of forgetting. Nothing was more Yankee than a Yankeeized person of foreign descent. It is the next generation, the third, that remembers with pride its roots in common heritage. In current terms, it is the third generation that fuels cultural identity and revival, the enthusiasm for multiculturalism. Since its formulation in 1937, Hansen's law has provoked much attention and criticism. In many ways, his argument is too simple, yet it captures a feature of immigration that remains pertinent, the renaissance of cultural identity in the context of its real decline. The sons and daughters who want to remember and honor their past are third-generation Americans. They are American-born and educated. They no longer feel any inferiority. Their confidence, perhaps comfort in their American identity, allows them to cultivate their past. Um, they carry with pride their national or ethnic identity, but what does it mean? They are also assimilated and lack the language, customs, and practices of their grandparents. Polish Americans do not speak Polish. African Americans know little of Africa. This is a truth that current multiculturalists do not know or want to know. To put it sharply, multiculturalism is not the opposite of assimilation, but its product. Many multiculturalists decorate their, their pronouncements with rote dismissals of the melting pot and assimilation, but a closer look and a more precise use of terms render their arguments questionable. Nathan Glazer and Daniel Moynihan's 1963 Beyond the Melting Pot stated flatly, The point about the melting pot is that it did not happen. This is easy to quote, but with a more careful examination of the terms and meaning, it is more plausible to argue the reverse. The point about the melting pot is that it did happen, and is happening. In fact, Glazer and Moynihan are clear. They do not mean distinctive language, customs, and culture persist or proliferate in American society, but 
These are lost by the third generation. They refer to the reality that New York Blacks, Jews, and Italians retain identities as interest and pressure groups, concentrating in certain occupations and geographic areas. By surveying neighborhood associations and political positions on welfare or schooling, Glazer and Moynihan argue that ethnic identity subsists, yet they deny that the groups have any particular cultural component, nor do they broach the idea that the ethnic blocs offer any fundamentally different political vision. On the contrary, New York ethnic, ethnic groups participate in mainstream political life, like mayoral elections. The other classic study from the early 1960s, Milton M. Gordon's Assimilation in American Life, using a much wider canvas than New York City, came to a roughly similar conclusion. Ethnic identity remains surprisingly hardy, yet Gordon also means sociologically, not culturally. Apart from minor modifications in cuisine, recreational patterns, place names, speech, residential architecture, sources of artistic inspiration, and perhaps a few other areas, he states, over the generations, the triumph of, of acculturation in America has been overwhelming. What has been blocked is sociologically. For Gordon, this means that each ethnic, religious, and national group has its own network of cliques, clubs, organizations, and institutions. Gordon calls this structural pluralism in contrast to cultural pluralism, which hardly exists. The term structural may mislead it may mislead, implying a density to pluralism that Gordon does not mean. He found that groups separate, separate along the lines of friendship patterns and associations, but not culturally. Structural separation does not depend on cultural separation. Black people hang out with black people and worship in black churches. Jews hang out with Jews and worship in synagogues. This does not mean these groups represent different cultures, or as Gordon states, it is possible for separate groups to continue their existence even while the cultural differences between them be become progressively reduced and even in greater part eliminated. In 1981, another sociologist, Steven Steinberg, published a tough-minded book, The Ethnic Myth, that appraised the talk of an ethnic upsurge in cultural identity. The thesis advanced here, he stated, is that the ethnic revival was a dying gasp on the part of ethnic groups descended from the great waves of immigration of the 19th and early 20th centuries. That is to say, the revival did not signify a genuine revitalization of ethnicity, but rather was symptomatic of the atrophy of ethnic cultures and the decline of ethnic communities. Placed in historical perspective, the revival appears to have been doomed from the outset, inasmuch as it could not possibly reverse trends that have been in the making for several generations. For Steinberg, as for other sober commentators, cultural and ethnic groups cannot sustain themselves against the homogenizing force of American society. Increasingly, cultural values and lifestyles are shaped by influences alien to the ethnic milieu, the mass media and popular culture, and on the one hand, or on the one hand, and educational institutions committed to universal values on the other. Rem what remains is weak and symbolic ethnicity. In a, new pre in a new preface to the ethnic myth, Steinberg um, laments the book's utter failure to dispel myths and misconceptions about race and ethnicity. To oppose these ideological currents is like swimming upstream. One starts out with a burst of energy, makes some headway, but eventually succumbs to the unrelenting downstream force. Another sociologist, Richard D. Alba, has also documented the ineluctable forces of assimilation, using indexes of languages spoken, residential neighborhoods, and intermarriages. He argues that the social basis for ethnic distinctiveness are eroding among Americans of European ancestry. As older, currently more ethnic generations are replaced by their children and grandchildren, who are less ethnic on average, the groups as a whole become less ethnic. None of this is easy to refute. Other investigators dismiss the widespread alarm that new immigration threatens the status of English. Recent immigrants are, are in fact learning English, writes the social scientist Jeffrey Nunberg, at a faster rate than any earlier generations of immigrants did,
and by all the evidence with at least as much enthusiasm. Whatever multiculturalism may mean to its, to its proponents, it most assuredly does not involve a rejection of English as the national lingua franca. For instance, new figures show that for recent Hispanic arrivals, becoming American entails not just mastering English, but also reject, rejecting the language and culture of one's parents. Oh, um, there's a page missing. Hold on, I have another copy up. So, okay. These simple and perhaps unpalatable truths go virtually without comment in the babble about multiculturalism. The United States is not becoming more but less multilingual. It is a relentlessly monolingual society, much more than other societies. Kalin's favorite example, example of a harmonious and diverse society was Switzerland, where bi and trilingualism are common. In the, United in the United States, on the other hand, fewer and fewer students study and acquire proficiency in foreign languages. In his damning study of the American curriculum, Tourists in Our Own Land, Clifford, Clifford Adelman of the U.S. Department of Education documents the precipitous decline in the serious study of languages. One might, one might imagine that enthusiastic multiculturalists might be alarmed. After all, language and culture sustain each other, yet they rarely mention it. In all the contemporary discussions of multiculturalism and cultural diversity, Adelman complains, we hear little, if anything, about native language and language maintenance, let alone do we see native speakers of English reaching out to immerse themselves in another culture through second language acquisition. Without studying another language, he states, people will never be more than tourists. In different terms, without acquiring another language, which few Americans do, learning about Africa through Kwanzaa is like learning about Germany through Oktoberfest. The inescapable forces of Americanization do not ensure that all groups participate in society with the same success. Those excluded because of racial or ethnic injustice, however, do not necessarily constitute a distinct culture. Suffering does not engender a culture. With the best of intentions, in 1959, the anthropologist Oscar Lewis introduced the term the culture of poverty to fathom the endemic impoverishment of Mexican families. Lewis himself was a lifelong socialist, with a fear of anti-Semitism that led him to change his name from Lefkowitz. He had first subtitled Five Families, The Anthropology of Poverty, but the sub subtitle of the published book ran Mexican Case Studies in the Culture of Poverty. The book and phrase Culture of Poverty proved popular. However, critics roundly denounced Lewis for implying that unique cultural traits and not economic conditions led to poverty. Nevertheless, the culture of approach enjoys unparalleled success. Few attend to the economic content of the culture, nor, as the anthropologist Charles A. Valentine trenchantly argued years ago, is much attention given to the relation of the relationship of the culture or the subculture to the larger society. Clarification of these matters sorry, clarification of these matters is very much overdue, if only because it has become so intellectually stylish to discover cultures everywhere in national and international life. By logic or observation, something sets a subgroup apart from a larger society or culture. What exactly? Without considering the wider frame, what appears distinct is mythologized, as if each group lived in a separate universe. For those who care to look, the evidence is everywhere that distinct cultures are not so distinct. In his provocative book on poor black children in Philadelphia, On the Edge, Carl H. Nightingale found that these kids increasingly have succumbed to consumer society, which preys on their vulnerability. Precisely because they are excluded and humiliated, they become fanatical devotees of name brands, gold chains, and pricey cars, insignias of American success. As soon as they are able, the kids begin to demand the basic building blocks of the b-boy outfit. Already at five and six, many kids in the neighborhood, Nightingale reports, 
can recite the whole canon of adult luxury from Gucci, Evan Picconi, Picconi, Piccioni, and Pierre Cardin to Mercedes and BMW. From the age of 10, kids become thoroughly engrossed in Nike's and Reebok's cult of the sneaker. Then, then comes the fascination with rappers and drug dealers. The ubiquitous rap tapes show a preoccupation with consumption and acquisition that never characterized the old soul and R&B hits. The lure of the local drug dealers arises from their glorification of blackness with virtuoso performances of conspicuous consumption. Netting Yale concludes that the cult of consumption has permeated the emotional and cultural life of poor urban African-American kids with devastating consequences. No group warns or no group wants to hear that it lacks culture, but that is not the issue. Rather, the question is how different the various cultures are from each other and from the dominant American culture. For instance, scholars from Melville, Herskovitz to Sterling Stuckey have documented the persistence of African tales, songs, and language in the American Black experience. This is a valid and valuable endeavor, but it does not mean that today African Americans constitute a distinct culture any more than do Italian Americans, Japanese Americans, or Jewish Americans. Little suggests that any group except the most marginal and inflexible can maintain or even wants to maintain a distinct culture within American society. Such groups do exist, but typically play a little role in multiculturalism because they want to be left out rather than let in. For instance, the Amish rarely figure in discussions of multiculturalism, not simply because they are a small group, but because they are too far outside the mainstream. Their absence, however, highlights the unspoken conformity of multiculturalism, in which the multiple cultures want more or less the same things. Unlike other American cultures, the Amish reject the use of electricity, automobiles, and most modern consumer goods. Their clothing, mainly sewn by themselves, has changed little over a century. They are almost pre-industrial and communitarian. Many outsiders may find this interesting or endearing, but nothing more. As one scholar of the Amish has commented, tourists are enchanted by the Amish, and academics tout their mental health and ecological soundness. Despite these accolades, few outsiders cast aside technological convenience to submit themselves to collective order of Amish life. As Randy Testa, who lived with the Amish, has written, Being Amish is not a lifestyle. I would not want to become Amish, nor could I. One could convert to Catholicism and still be used, be a used car dealer, an investment banker, or the owner of a beauty salon. These occupations do not exist within Amish society. Being Amish is a faith and a completely encompassing way of life. For better or worse, conversion to the Amish faith would mean leaving the worldly world behind. The simple truths of Americanization would not surprise the originators of the idea of cultural diversity. C cultural pluralism, as Kalin formulated it 80 years ago, may have been a brave effort to preserve cultural identity in the face of a repressive Americanization. It was this and something more or less. It was also a half step in ineluctable cultural accommodation. Kalin, born in Silesia, was brought to the United States by his father, an Orthodox rabbi. As the oldest and until the eighth child, the only son, Kalin was expected to follow his father into the Orthodox rabbinate. Yet the father's implacable religious world repelled the son, who considered him strict and authoritarian. I didn't like him, admitted Kalin, who regularly fled from home as a boy. Only when his father was dying did they reconcile at which time Kalin penned a grudging appreciation. He was the last of the old school of Jews who made absolutely no concession to their environment. Kalin wanted Judaism to make concessions to the environment and move toward the mainstream, becoming secular, humanist, scientific, conditioned on the industrial, uh, industrial economy without having ceased to be livingly Jewish. <clears throat> Kalen and the others who joined him in the program of cultural pluralism, like the African-American Alain Locke, may have been more successful than they wished. 
Today, the terms cultural pluralism, multiculturalism, and cultural diversity do not designate different lives, but different lifestyles in American society. The diverse cultures all dream of, plan for, and sometimes enjoy the same American success. Only the ideologues of multiculturalism have not heard the news. The dearth of economic and sociological analyses, the inflation of cultural approaches, the assumption that cultures fundamentally diverge, the failure or inability to consider the forces of assimilation and homogenization, and the lack of any political vision or alternative all characterize current discussions of multiculturalism. The politics that emerges either ratifies familiar and estimable sentiments about respecting all groups, or pretends to a subversiveness that has no foundation. A recent collection exemplifies the anemic concepts and timid politics of liberal multiculturalism. The authors of multiculturalism assume that cultures fundamentally conflict and ponder how liberalism can reconcile antagonistic demands. The volume pivots about the politics of recognition an essay by an esteemed liberal philosopher, Charles Taylor. For Taylor, recognition is not simply a courtesy we owe one another, but a vital human need based on the fact that life is dial dialogical. We define ourselves through contact with others. Unfortunately, with the modern age, the need for recognition often goes unmet. Misrecognition implies more than disrespect. It can inflict a grievous wound, saddling its victims with a crippling self-hatred. It gets worse. Classic liberalism handed out recognition evenly or at least tried, sometimes successfully, to ignore differences of class or gender or race. Unfortunately, the principle of equality clashes with a new idea or need, what Taylor calls the politics of difference grounded in the age of authenticity, which he dates from Rousseau and Herder. According to Taylor, authenticity is the notion that there is a certain way of being that is my way. I am called upon to live my life in this way. Being true to myself means being true to my own originality. Taylor seeks to reconcile the equal recognition that basic liberalism bestows and a special recognition required by authenticity that underlies multiculturalism. Taylor happily gnaws on this nut. How can the egalitarianism of classic liberalism be reconciled with a multiculturalism demanding special recognition for specific cultures. Yet to get at the fruit, he glosses over serious issues. For starters, what is authenticity and how is it achieved? For Taylor, authenticity sustains the differences that constitute multiculturalism, but he mythologizes the concept. A favorite of continental existentialists like Martin Heidegger, the level-headed Canadian philosopher teams up with murky Heide Heideggerians. As T.W. Adorno argued in his polemic against the Heideggerians, the jargon of authenticity, authenticity itself is a, is, a sus, is a suspect concept. It claims a profundity it has not earned. The term evokes inwardness and rootedness, assuming a mythic, formal, and empty cast. Someone is or is not authentic based on what? Objectivity is jettisoned, wrote Adorno while subjectivity becomes the judge of authenticity. The notion of authenticity ends in tautologies. The self constitutes the self. Man is he who he is, stated Heidegger, the prime exponent of the cult of authenticity. Although Taylor's formulations lack the mock profundity of the Heideggerians, they partake of the same logic and jargon. Authenticity accords moral importance to a kind of contact with myself, with my own inner nature. It greatly increases the importance of this self-contact by introducing the principle of originality. Each of our voices has something unique to say. Authenticity mythologizes the self. At worst, it follows orders. Even Taylor's phrases betray the deceit. I am called upon to live my life in this way. Who is calling? Authenticity claims a radical individualism while dragging out the genealogical tables to expel the unauthentic. It reeks of mysticism in the police. Moreover, Taylor glides from the mythology of authentic individuals to that of authentic cultures, an even more dubious idea. Presumably, certain authentic cultures need special recognition.
what cultures and what sort of recognition. Apart from regular references to Quebec, a fog descends. Like many commentators, Taylor simply posits that all societies are becoming increasingly multicultural, as if this were self-evident, and he assumes that the majority culture threatens minority cultures without bothering to tell us what minority cultures um, is he's referring to or what is distinct about them. It even might be questioned whether Quebec represents a distinct culture. The Fr French language dominates in Quebec, but does a language make a culture? Not really, in the opinion of many historians. Language is merely one and not necessarily the primary way of distinguishing between cultural communities, states Eric Hobsbawm. The political claims to independence in Poland or Belgium were not language-based, nor was the Irish movement in Britain. Language quarrels do not necessarily indicate two cultures clashing. If Quebec becomes an independent nation, would an observer conclude that Montreal and Toronto represent different cultures? In any event, Taylor fails to get very far. The notion that life is dialogical and requires mutual recognition cannot be contested, but also hardly needs affirmation. The belief that withholding of recognition can be a form of oppression sounds like psychobabble, the philosophical version of the self-esteem chatter applied to cultures as a whole. What mangles people are bad, or no jobs, decaying communities, tattered human relations and defective education rather than misrecognition, whatever that might mean. Reality gives Taylor and his philosophical colleagues the creeps, however. Taylor derives the homogenizing trends in society from a conception of equal rights, not a social reality. His commentators pick up the baton, operating with notions of culture that are threatened or threatening, but they skimp on details. Michael Waltzer tells us that the dominant culture endanger, endangers minority cultures. Some nationalities or social unions or cultural communities are more at risk than others. And if this is too vague, he audaciously explains, the public culture of American life is more supportive, say, of this way of life than of that. The say here is priceless. The philosopher's announcement of a bold foray while shuffling the old lecture notes. Taylor and his colleagues address real conflicts, yet the jargon of recognition, authenticity, and cultural self-esteem muddies the waters. They hardly ponder what constitutes a culture and what is multiculturalism within a single society. In fact, they slip from multiculturalism to cultural differences, ways of life, and even ways of viewing the world as if these were all the same. This allows several contributing or contributors to write of women as a disadvantaged culture, suffering from failed recognition. What culture do women constitute? Does it vary from society to society? The conceptual slackness of these judicious thinkers enables the arguments to unfold. It is much easier to write of cultural differences in advanced industrial society, which obviously exist, than different cultures, which may not. For instance, it is possible to point to Christmas, Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa as illustrating cultural differences. It is less possible to discuss them as representing different cultures within American society. A sober view of these holidays, in fact, might conclude that they register not differences, but similarities. In the Anglo-American world, Christmas always entailed popular celebrations, but not till the 19th century did it mean shopping and exchanging gifts. Santa Claus himself emerges out of a motley compound of images to become a gift giver. Toy and confectionery shopkeepers, writes the historian Lee Eric Schmidt, with their prime interest in children as a market, led the way in using Santa Claus. Partly because it falls in December, Hanukkah, a minor holiday, has become a major holiday for Jews, and has taken on one of the trappings of Christmas, the giving of gifts, which it did not originally include. A black activist professor invented Kwanzaa, situated between Christmas and New Year's Day, to give African Americans an alternative to Christmas. It was intended to remain non-commercial, for example, through the exchange of homemade gifts, but has increasingly surrendered to market forces. <laughs>
these realities do not intrude upon the philosophical quest for authenticity and recognition. Taylor wrestles with the conundrum, concluding, There must be something midway between the inauthentic and homogenizing demand for recognition of equal worth, on the one hand, and the self-immurement within ethnocentric standards on the other. There must be, but Taylor only suggests caution. The presumption of equal worth required of us is not peremptory and inauthentic judgments, but a willingness to be open to comparative cultural study of the kind that must displace our horizons in the resulting fusions. The timid conclusions, chalky language, and toothless concepts are hardly rare among political philosophers. In fact, they thrive on this stuff. They cannot get enough of it. Taylor's distinguished commentators fall, o fall over themselves in their enthusiasm for his essay. Extraordinarily rich and remarkable, rejoices Susan Wolfe, a Johns Hopkins, Hopkins University philosophy professor. They have never read anything quite as stimulating. The collection suggests a liberalism that has lost its bone and muscle. Nevertheless, Taylor and the liberal philosophers are clear and honest thinkers next to those further to the left. In the multicultural sea, leftists sail ahead by huffing and puffing about power, difference, and marginalization. They fill endless essays and books with talk of radical and transformative multiculturalism. What is subversive is never quite specific. The relentless repetition of terms like counter-hegemonic, disruption, and contestation suggests a nagging doubt. The terms must be included in every sentence, lest the edifice, lest the edifice collapse. Homi K. Baba, a University of Chicago professor, is a master practitioner. Cultural, dif cultural difference must not be understood as the free play of pol polarities and pluralities. The drawing of meanings and values generated in the process of cultural interpretation is an effect of the perplexity of living in the limit liminal spaces of national society. Cultural difference as a form of intervention participates in a logic of supplementary subversion similar to the strategies of minority discourse. The question of cultural difference faces us with a disposition of knowledges or a distribution of practices that exist beside each other. Abs absits, absits, designating a form of social contradiction or antagonism that has to be negotiated rather than sublated. The difference between disjunctive sites and representations of social life have to be articulated without surmounting the incommensurable meanings and judgments that are produced within the process of transcultural negotiation. The radical program on multiculturalism might be characterized as jargon attached to an air compressor. A recent collection, Mapping Multiculturalism, exemplifies the genre. Its editors want to establish that real multiculturalism surpasses liberal assimilation or pluralism. True multiculturalism is more robust and threatening. They offer a three-point guide to pick the real McCoy from the crowd of pretenders. First, real multiculturalism has been more hospitable to a whole range of perspectives on gender, sexuality, new, new pan-ethnicities, and new nations like queer nation than has ordinary pluralism. Second, real multiculturalism has strongly endorsed racially-based group identities and anti-essentialism anti at the same time. Finally, a transformative multiculturalism seeks political parity, a real multiculturalism requires political as well as cultural inclusion, requires the sharing of power among relevant groups. This stuff would take pages to unravel. At its best, it represents familiar, familiar liberalism parading as something more. If multiculturalism is defined as being open to new perspectives, then few could oppose it. At its worst, it represents the conservative nightmare come true, mindless relativism. Multiculturalism means embracing whatever comes, tearing down the turnpike of history. Every truck is dubbed a culture, and some even get tagged nations, as in queer nation. The question is how gender or pan-ethnicity constitutes a new culture, much less a nation. About this, the authors say nothing. 
Critical thought requires conceptual care and precision. Nowadays, this has been exchanged for cheerleading and academic bombast. The statement that multiculturalism endorses with equal enthusiasm racial and non-racial groups in the parlance anti-essentialism relies on an old sleight of hand. If you cannot figure it out, say both. The demand for political power and parity is the nub of the matter, however. On the basis of equality, it is possible to demand more women in the military, more African Americans in government, or more Latino policemen. But what does this have to do with multiculturalism? The multicultural dynamic is assumed, but rarely explained. Individuals apparently pop up as carriers of divergent cultures. Presumably, the black policeman, like the black law professor, represents a different culture than the non-black colleague. The multiculturalists pretend to liquidate false generalizations while trading in them. Even a term like Eurocentrism is objectionable, as if a homogeneous European culture existed, as if Adolf Hitler and Anne Frank represent the same Europe. Nor is it accurate historically. Far from being Eurocentric, writes the classicist Karl Galinsky, the Greco-Roman world encompassed all of the Mediterranean, including North Africa and Egypt, much of the Near East, and at times sizable portions of the Middle East extending as far as Afghanistan and the Indus Valley. None of this matters. The main goal is power or empowerment or jobs or resources. The call for power sounds radical and serious, especially coupled to multiculturalism. In fact, power devoid of a vision or program means little. It is a demand that certain people get more authority and clout. Again, increased representation of women or African Americans in various fields can be defended straightforwardly in the name of equality. As desirable as this goal may be, it suggests little of multiculturalism and nothing of sub of subversion. Do black mayors represent a different culture, or female Supreme Court judges? And should they? After the rhetoric is stripped away, the call for power and its decayed psychological form, empowerment, suggests a converging politics, monoculturalism. Everyone wants a bigger piece of the same action. Of course, the partisans put up a firestorm of revolutionary rhetoric. Aside from the reasonable problem proposals to redraw curriculums and textbooks, the demands have precious little to do with multiculturalism. For instance, two professors want a multiculturalism that goes beyond a benign study of various groups or simplistic exposure to different cultures. Rather, Ted Gordon and Wanima Lubiano argue that multiculturalism requires a reconsideration and restructuring of the ways in which knowledge is organized and used to support inequitable power differentials. This means that those of us interested in a transformative multiculturalism must insist that it cannot be held to exist within dominance. The uncertain English reflects the uncertain politics. What could it mean that multiculturalism cannot exist within dominance? Is this a call for revolution? Subversion? Not exactly. It is important that minority people be part of all levels of the university chain of command, that they be an empowered presence at the levels of policy making. A transformative multiculturalism must address the university relations to staff workers and their racial, gender, and class makeup. These positions, which are very common, betray an unlimited ability to mythologize. To participate in policy making constitutes revolutionary multiculturalism. To challenge the organization of knowledge may be desirable, but what does that mean and what does cultural pluralism have to do with it? Like other exponents of radical multiculturalism, Gordon and Lubiano refer vaguely to minority and non-Western knowledge, as if they inherently subverted domination and hierarchy. How? Does Chinese culture undermine hierarchy? Does Hinduism... To improve relations with staff workers and increase minority possibilities may also be highly desirable, but what have they they to do with multiculturalism? Do various staff workers represent different cultures? With Lubiano and other enthusiasts, multiculturalism becomes a shorthand for anything desirable.
Radical multiculturalism, she writes, can include attempting to influence decisions such as whether to focus on high-tech military research, Department of Defense contracts, or fuel air explosives, instead of contributing to research based on meeting housing needs. Once past the jabber about hegemony, difference, and domination, this politics is defined by appointments and jobs. The not-so-revolutionary demand to be part of the university bureaucracy or the corporate world. In cruder terms, radical multiculturalists want more of their own people in the organization. This is fully understandable, but it is not radical, and it is barely political. It suggests patronage, not revolution. The discussions of marginalization often evidence rank, often evidence rank bad faith. One could say the Amish or Hasidic Jews are marginalized, yet they themselves do not proclaim their mar- marginality, either because they do not see it or because it does not trouble them. They have no interest in joining the mainstream. On the other hand, the radical multiculturalists, post-colonialists, and other cutting-edge theorists <clears throat> gush about marginality with the implicit and sometimes explicit goal of joining the mainstream. They specialize in marginalization <clears throat> to up their market value. Again, this is understandable. The poor and excluded want to be wealthy and included. But why is this multicultural or subversive? For instance, an exponent of Native American studies denounces the educational imperialism of Eurocentric education. Native traditions challenge at root the dominant subordinate the dominant subordinate construction and the social hegemony of Euro-American superiority. Up to now, Eurocentrism, Eurocentrism centrism, <laughs> marginalizes ethnic studies or American Indian studies or gender studies, states M. Annette James Guerrero, a California professor. Like where though? Like I don't, I'm not sure that's true. What must be done? Head for the hills, blow out the mainstream institutions? Not exactly. American Indian studies will need to be able to stand on its own as a fully accredited discipline with departmental status, and even with a broader institutional standing. That exists, though. This is typically argued without losing a beat. Ethnic studies is marginalized. It threatens the core of Western domination. Conclusion? We want the Western overlords to give us more support and money. Once upon a time, revolutionaries tried or pretended to try to make a revolution. They harbored a vision of a different world or society. Now dubbed radical multiculturalists, they apply for bigger offices. <clears throat> Another effort to carve out a radical, even socialist multiculturalism has been made by Nancy Fraser, a well-regarded political theorist. For all its vigor, it also surrenders to jargon and platitudes. Part of its failing may be due to historical innocence. Fraser states grandly that the interimbrication of culture and political economy is a late motif of my, of all my work. Whatever interimbrication might mean, Fraser seems unaware that many earlier political thinkers, such as Emil Durkheim and Max Weber, wrestled with the relation of culture and political economy. Her own intellectual world rarely reaches back beyond 1980. Fraser is not happy with those like Taylor who see multiculturalism based on failed recognition. This implies that more esteem or appreciation would settle grievances. She wants to supplement the exclusively cultural outlook with one targeting socioeconomic injustice. People suffer from joblessness, pollution, and ill health which cultural recognition will not heal. Fraser separates the two dimensions, cultural and economic injustice. The first calls for some sort of cultural or symbolic change, or what she calls recognition, which is Taylor's concern. The latter calls for a political, economic restructuring of some sort or redistribution, which Fraser wants. As a good political scientist, she realizes the real world does not fit her categories. Most collectivities are ambivalent, suffering from both cultural and economic injustice. 
For instance, African Americans are not simply the object of cultural insults, but economic injustice. The difference between liberalism and radicalism, or in her lingo, affirmative and transformative remedies, pivots on the cures to this bivalent suffering. Mainstream multiculturalism supports affirmative remedies, which may undo disrespect, but leave intact fundamental structures. Transformative remedies inspired by deconstruction change the underlying foundation. How is this accomplished? She explains, By destabilizing existing group identities and differentiations, these transformative remedies would not only raise the self-esteem of members of currently disrespected groups, they would change everyone's sense of self. Fraser trumps liberal psychobabble about self-esteem by promising to change everyone's self and destabilize groups to boot. She understands the vagueness of her program and helpfully uh, provides one example, homosexuality and homophobia. Liberal remedies seek to revalue gay and lesbian identity. Her approach promises much more. Transformative remedies associated with queer politics seek to reconstruct or deconstruct the homo-hetero dichotomy so as to destabilize all fixed sexual identities. They aim to sustain a sexual field of multiple, debinarized, fluid, ever-shifting differences. So ends her clarifying example. Should children be raised in a family lacking stable sexual identities? Of course, such a pedestrian concern never darkens this advanced theorizing. Fraser simply supposes that radicalism demands more destabilizing, fluid, and multiple differences. Why? Are these always desirable and liberating? Though it is hardly a counter-argument, most people probably think they already suffer from too much instability. Why should the radical project seek to render everything fluid and multiple? None of this is explained because it is inexplicable. Despite its theoretical pretense, radical thought dishes out the adolescent cliché that what is fixed is bad and what moves is good. Fraser regularly repeats that radicals destabilize gender and race. Her feminism replaces gender dichotomies by networks of multiple intersecting differences that are demassified and shifting. What multiple intersecting differences are and why they are desirable is not evident. Her real inspiration comes from the market and consumerism, where quantity, change, and hype constitute the game. Hmm. Fraser still occasionally uses the term socialism and even once the term utopia, but her idiom sinks them. To make her program sound political, she throws in hackneyed slogans to awaken leftists who slumbered through the demonstration of interimbrication. Academic blather and political claptrap fit seamlessly together. This is a quote. Transformative redistribution to redress racial injustice in the economy consists of some form of anti-racist democratic socialism or anti-racist social democracy. And transformative recognition to redress racial injustice in the culture consists of anti-racist deconstruction aimed at dismantling Eurocentrism, Euro, Eurocentrism by destabilizing racial dichotomies. Bereft of ideas, leftists and liberals enthusiastically celebrate cultural pluralism to fill the void. They string together buzzwords like cultural identity, authenticity, counter-hegemonic, representation, transformative, and destabilizing, which elicit nods from the camp followers, and they add a couple of stale political slogans as proof of their political righteousness. This vast literature is animated by a meager vision, The demise of utopia makes way for the party of multiculturalists.